You know, if you are open to the potential opportunity, the potential growth, you can do anything. This is Entrepreneurs the Playbook, where I give you access each week to the world's greatest athletes and executives about their personal and professional playbook and what has made them champions on and off the field. This is the playbook. Hi, this is Dave Meltzer, CEO of Sports One Marketing, here with Entrepreneur the Playbook. And what an honor it is to be here in Santa Clara with I think the most notable athlete of Santa Clara, as far as I'm concerned, oh. Brandy Chastain, <laughs> Olympian and humanitarian. Welcome to The Playbook. Thank you so much. I'll have to have a conversation with uh, Brent Jones and Steve Nash about that, but That's I'll take right. it. I'll take I, it. Thank you so much. You know what? You know, you can talk about different athletes and running a big sports agency. We're always, you know, saying, well, who's the best at this and that? You know, my uh, opinion is more credible. So <laughs> you can tell okay. Brent, who is my client. <laughs> You can tell oh, him Dave Meltzer said that we were a more uh, notable athlete. And uh, I'm sure, too, walking the streets, uh, you would find it to be the same. As a marketing guy, I would rather market you today than anyone else from Santa oh, Clara. That's very nice. And maybe I will in esports as we have go. that discussion. Well, I'm going to start with something interesting that I uh, heard that you said was that it's hard to have perspective when things are going well. Yeah. And I found that. I, I actually made my guys type that in because I'm a huge illusion and perspective person, and I wanted to really get involved and understand what did you mean by that? Well, I have to go way back okay. into my soccer career. Um, you know, even as a young kid, soccer, for whatever reason, came really easy for me. It made sense, it felt right, um, I was successful, and then, in my freshman year of college, I tore my ACL. And so, being on and the was so at Berkeley? That was at Cal Berkeley. Yeah. And so being on the sideline for the first time was an eye-opening experience, you know, not to be the one who was scoring all the goals or making all the assists or really impacting the game in kind of a real concrete way. And that was hard. And so all of a sudden I kind of started sitting back going, what do the other players do? How do they feel? Well, what is it that the routines that they go through? And I started learning a lot of lessons that, one, I learned that I was a terrible teammate first. That was the first thing I learned. Like, I needed to change what I was doing and how I was approaching. And wh why do you think you were a terrible teammate? Tell, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I think I, was a, I wasn't a great teammate because I, w I didn't see the big picture. So it was really so very, uh, the, the, the perspective was from just inside me. What did I need? What did I want? What was the things that, how could I, it was always I. Yeah. Um, and well, I you wanted the team to win. Yeah, I always yeah. wanted the team to win, but if... The, you know, I, and I coach young kids now, it's like I see this happening again and again, whereas if I wasn't the one who was producing, I wasn't as happy for the team's success as I was when I did well and the team was successful. And if the team lost and you did well, how do you feel? I think I was conflicted. Yeah. I was very conflicted about, you know, well, I did my job if everybody else Almost would do resentful. theirs. Would that be fair? Uh, I don't know if it was resentment, yeah. but it could, I mean, maybe we it could young. lean towards that. Yeah, I was young and very dumb, for sure. Um, I'm in that club. Yeah, so, so that was tough. But then, you know, I, I recovered from that, and I kind of had a change in my academic career. And I came home, and I went to a junior college, and it was, again, it was a, a good opportunity to say, okay, what am I doing? You know, what is it that I really want to achieve? And then I decided to come to Santa Clara University. And literally, I think it was within a week, maybe 10 days of making that decision, I tore my other ACL. Yeah. And so, yeah, to have it done again. But I think, again, without that experience, and especially the second time, you know, because now I knew, okay, it's going to be hard. It's, you know, maybe it's not fair. Uh, it's not what you wanted. It wasn't your plan. How are you going to go about getting to the end result, which is being healthy and being back on the field and being productive? And so that, for me, I think the second time just added to the perspective of the first time, which was it was all great until it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, wow, I w really didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it. Did from you a think good the, fir the, the first time you, you're, you injured yourself, I'm sure you, it sounds like you saw it as a huge setback. Totally. The second time, it sounds like almost you thought it was a setup. It, it was a setup and an opportunity. I, yeah. I took it more so as an opportunity to be more prepared. Uh, you know, what I didn't know before was, you know, I came from a family who, working class, you know, honest day's work, 
didn't have a lot of knowledge about nutrition, you know, I mean, I didn't know anything about how nutrition and sleep and proper, you know, preparation in terms of maybe it would be body training, weight training, cross training, Stretching. a lot of things, you know, I just went out, I was soccer, I was good at soccer, I played everything else, but just like overall, what was the plan and how I was going to get there? And so I think the second one was like, okay, I got this and I can be even more successful and ready to go. I mean, I think it took me about a year after my first knee injury to really be back to myself. I didn't have a year to be ready in the second time around because my clock was ticking for the NCAA right. and I was about to start the season, which I got hurt in the spring and fall is the season. So it was six months to the day back playing. Granted, it was with a full brace, but you know, to get there was, was a lot more work, I think, than I did before, but I was ready for it. And it was amazing. Is it the most fulfilling thing that you did, you think, coming back that quickly and so successfully? I think just, I, I have two comeback stories. I think that's yeah. the one. Mm -hmm. And then the second is, I was on the World Cup team in 91. We, you know, we win the championship and it's the first time ever in the history of women's soccer that we're having a World Cup. And then I was cut. Right. No real explanation, no reason. In 93 you were cut, right? I was right. cut, yeah. yeah. And then the next World Cup was 95. And to not be on that team, you know, that was like, that was another gut check, you know, reality, yeah. like, okay, perspective. So to come back to that team, I think, because I had the previous experiences, I realized here are the things that I needed to do personally to be a better teammate so that I could be successful. Did quitting ever, when you got cut, I could understand the injuries and you're young and the quitting probably didn't go through your mind uh, when you were young at Berkeley and got right. hurt. It's like, okay, how am I going to come back yeah. and this is the first adversity I'm facing. But you're a little bit older and you get cut from the team. Did quitting cross your mind? No, I don't think quitting crossed my mind. I, I think what crossed my mind was how am I going to be better than I am mm -hmm. when I feel like I'm really good? Right. You know, and, and how am I going to prove that I belong in that environment. You know, how do you change someone's mind? You know, it's like if you have a boss who says, okay, this is where you fit and this is what you do, but you believe maybe you have something more. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you convince that person who already kind of has um, a perspective of you? And so that was, I think that was the hardest thing to do was to change the mind of somebody else um, by showing the action. So it was really action oriented for me and then the openness of the coach to, and those two merge together. To see, right, and it's interesting because we all think it's not fair. Yeah, it didn't it feel happens. fair. It does, right? <laughs> and, and you know, we've all been in classes, we've been in businesses where somebody has a perspective of us yeah. and we have a choice. Yes. How, how do I change their perspective? And it's not by trying to force them to re-engineer the perspective by convincing them with words. Mm, it, definitely it, not. We have to re-engineer our own vision of ourselves. And it sounds like that's what you did. You, you were, I mean, wise beyond your years to say, wait a second, this might not be fair. I always tell my kids, the only fairness that I know is down in Del Mar with the <laughs> pigs and the Ferris wheel. And that's yeah. where you can find fair. Mm. But if you're expecting fair, I haven't seen it anywhere other than being fair to yourself and, and being accountable. Um, so you, you go back and re-engineer yourself. How did you re-engineer yourself to convince the coaches that, hey, I deserve to be on the next World Cup team? I think the number one thing was recognizing that there was an opportunity going to be coming. You know, with the conclusion of the 95 World Cup and we came in third place, which on a world level, it's pretty good. I just wish the women would get as much credit for being the world's best. We will. And that We're they working deserve. on that. I'm a big fan and proponent of equality in that measure, and they should be paid marketing dollars even more for what they've done. Oh, very little, nice. Little thank, speech and commercial. But. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so when, when I got a chance to be invited back to the training camp, I told myself, I had a conversation, a little like sit-down conversation with myself about being ready right and so what does it mean for me to be ready I had to work harder in a few areas you know that was nutrition sleep um, physical fitness soccer parts just continued doing what I was doing so then I get the opportunity to go to training camp for the first time at the end of 95 and I think this is the this is the lesson I wasn't expecting and that the one that I always tell people be ready for this because it's coming whether you believe it or not and that's change 
You know, change <laughs> is coming, so don't be surprised by change. Uh, embrace change as a wonderful opportunity to explore yourself and to find different things about yourself that maybe you didn't know existed. I have so, a great line for because yes. you're a coach now. Yes. You have to use this for change because I've learned this. I forget who I stole this from, but someone told me, I said, oh, you know, it's so hard to get people to change. I'm trying to motivate these kids and blah, blah, blah. They said, make them babies. I was like, what? Because babies are the only ones oh. that like to be changed. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, funny. Right? Treat them all like a baby. That. So good. Fair I hate enough. to interrupt. We're testing, no, no, no. testing your ADD. I Let's like it. I like it. <laughs> So um, I went to the first training camp and it went really it went really well. I told myself I'm going to be the best player on the field. At that time US soccer and the and the team was having a contract issue. So the starting team and the pool was not there. So this was the players who wanted to come up, you know, younger players, maybe some players like myself who had been there before. So I made a promise to myself I'm going to I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to be seen, I'm going to be recognized. This my actions are going to speak louder than my words. And I did. And that was the, really the first time for me where it was like I had to dig deeper than I ever, ever had before to be ready. So then after the second training camp when they were making the decision about who would be coming in to play for the first ever Olympic team, 1996. I mean, my gosh, can you imagine <laughs> what that, that's like, the Olympics are so different than the World Cup. Which right. one's better? I get that question all the time. Which one do you like more? They're different. But to be in the Olympic arena and the Olympic family is just something as a kid you grow up watching. I mean, I watched the Dream Team and then I watched Miracle on Ice. And My <laughs> yeah, and I said, I want to do that. And at the time, I didn't know what that was, but something about that American flag and that, that camaraderie and that patriotism. So I wanted to be in that group. So after that second camp, which I felt really good at, the team was back with, with um, the full group was back. We all had meetings. We had a sit-down meeting just like this across the table, and we said, "You've had a really great two camps, and you know my heart is pounding, and you know you you want to hear the things you want to hear, which is you, you know we're going to invite you back." And so Tony, the late Tony DeChico, our coach at the time, says, "We we want you on the team. We need you on this team." And oh my gosh, like my it's I'm insane, just feel right? oh I'm just feeling so good. It's like the best moment. And he goes, "But not as a forward." as a defender. And it was like, wah, 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 right? right? <laughs> the rest of the story. Hit and you. you know, my, my jaw, I'm sure if it physically, no, if my jaw didn't yeah. physically drop, that's what it felt like. But in that moment, I had to decide, was my pride too big and say, I'm a forward, this is what I do, or did I want to be on the US Women's National Team and go to the Olympics? And I certainly wanted to do the latter more than I wanted yeah. to. Was Tony the one that cut you as well? And I no, he wasn't, went, but he was on the staff. He, took, he was. He was on the staff. He worked with the goalkeepers um, strictly for the most part, but then he became the head coach. Was right, okay. And so in that moment, it was like, this is my aha moment. This is my, I'm taking it on, you know? If I'm not good enough to play between Christine Lilly, who's played more times than anyone on the planet Earth, and our captain, Carla Overbeck, then I shouldn't be there anyway. So I'm gonna say yes. And I think that was really the turning point. It was the saying yes to something that was a little scary, unknown, you know, not in my wheelhouse, but how could I use the strengths that I had as a forward in this new position? And to be honest with you, is it, it wasn't easy all the time. It wasn't always what I wanted to do, but I kind of saw things coming because I had been that other person facing the defender. So I felt like at times I was ahead of the play and I was like, oh, this is awesome. So it was a great opportunity. Now, being the world's best at something, one, one of the things that I loved about and love about my profession is I believe surround yourself with the right people yeah. and the right ideas. So I've been blessed to market the Pro Football Hall of Fame and to have a partner like Warren Moon and Ronnie Lott and, you know, because I figured I'd take on that energy and, yes. and to be able to interview people like you. But when you're hyper competitive, I, I tell people also, you can't be the world's best at something unless one, you're a little bit OCD, <laughs> if not a lot, and two, you're hyper competitive. That, that's what it takes to be, you have to be consistent every day, persistent without quit, but with those other qualities. Mm -hmm. But at times I see every great athlete and world's best, they're asked to surrender in some way. Yeah. And it's such a conflict because you are the queen of being competitive and winning and everything going your way and that the universe tells Warren Moon you can't play quarterback anymore, you're going to Canada for six years. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, Ronnie's hurt, you know, and you cut off your finger, you know. But there's a moment of surrender. Yeah. How do you reconcile 
that competitive OCD superpower against there's a power greater than I and I'm going to make the, you, you said, I, I forget the words you used, we'll have to go back on the tape, but you said something like, this was my aha moment. I'm going to use this yeah. to be even better and expand higher and greater. Well, I think I go, I go back to the injury situation and sitting on the sideline and, you know, I really never understood the emotional side, the mental side of participating in athletics and how that really could be transformative on the field in a physical manifestation, right? So if, if I was weak mentally, if I didn't like something and it got to me, I was weaker on the field. And I never, you know, I never thought about it. If I didn't like the decision of somebody, it made me weaker when I needed to be strong. And so... It's like forgiveness, right? I tell people all the time, you yeah. don't forgive other people because they deserve it. Forgive it because you deserve it. And it's the same Let thing. It go. You deserve this, right? You deserve this. You know, you think about those attacking thoughts that you're less than you are. There's a shortage, void, or obstacle. Then you are. You don't give any energy to it. You, and the universe comes back and rewards you. What, what happened at the end of that great switch to... to uh, Olympic gold medals and World Cup championships. But I think also now it's an opportunity to be a coach of young girls and mentor them for these very same lessons. It's like, you know, we all, I think every generation is the same. You know, everybody wants to find that comfort zone and that happiness and that be successful to whatever that definition is for them. Um, but, you know, when we're young, we don't, we don't have perspective. And when we've had things good, we don't understand hardship. And so, I'm trying to just impart on them these little stories and as a reminder to myself, even as a coach, I don't have it all right. I don't know all the answers okay. and I'm vulnerable to that and I let them know. Like it's okay not to know all the answers and it's okay not to um, be the one always scoring or making the right decision and that's okay. But if you accept that, then you can move forward. Because if you don't accept it, then you're not going forward. You know, if you are open to the potential opportunity, the potential growth, you can do anything without a doubt. Now, it's, it's interesting as an empowering woman, and you do so much for, for women, but, but I'm in a stage of my life, I have three daughters and, and a little boy. Mm -hmm. I grew up with five boys and a sister. My mom's my hero. And so I have a different perspective because I really think with women who are so successful in sports, right? You are a great golfer now and and that it's really important that boys look up to you as much as we empower all these girls i think it's really important for these stories to be shared to the similarities to to be brought out and enhanced instead of a lot of times we're trying to figure out the differences to protect everybody equality and i think a lot of times someone like you you know, can really bring together everyone. We, we did the, the Rose Bowl Inspire videos. Yeah. And it was amazing. Um, you know, it's really empowered the Rose Bowl legacy itself. And I'm just amazed of all generations of men who are predominantly involved with the Rose Bowl because it was originally just known for football, mm -hmm. a very male-dominated sport, especially yeah. college football. Okay. <laughs> and yet, I'm just amazed how many people, you know, we do these internet things about their favorite video and their most inspirational person and your name comes up oh. and it makes me feel so great because I'd like to know that as a father I'm gonna go home tonight talk to my eight-year-old and tell him guess who I got to meet and then have him google you because I could never do it justice <laughs> right and when he does that he's blind to yeah. any because he just sees this athletic hero right the one who can sink the winning putt still once he's playing with men and women and have a great time leading to the last question you know, the world changes so fast. We were talking about esports, we're talking about videos, we're talking about Olympics and World Cups and who knows what else. What legacy, and, and you do so much already to give back, but what legacy, when it's all done, would you like to leave? Well, le legacy is a big word. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of gravity, uh, I think, in, in that word. And uh, I think initially, our teams, World Cup teams and Olympic teams, the legacy was that we brought more girls to soccer and more people to soccer. Boys, girls, men, women, you know, nobody, somebody who'd never watched soccer before, someone who loved soccer. Like the Tiger Woods of golf, right? Yeah, we brought, we brought so many people. Yeah, we brought so many people to the game. 
And then, you know, as, that, as time has kind of gone between that last, you know, Olympic Games in 2004 or that World Cup in 99, then it became, okay, well, but what else? Like, you bring people there, but, you know, what does that mean? And then I started working with um, the Concussion Legacy uh, Foundation. And you donated your brain. And I donated my brain. And I started thinking about, well, I was working here at Santa Clara with, the Institute of Sports Law and Ethics. And every year we would give out an award. And it just so happened that um, Dr. Robert Cantu and Chris Nowinski were the recipients of our Ethos Award uh, for the work that they were doing in, uh, in studying the brains and CTE and you know very important work. And the idea of protecting those who are the most vulnerable, as, parent, as a parent you understand that. Nice. Like you would do anything to protect your kids. And so, I said, at the, after we gave them their award, we had, a, we had a board meeting and it was like, okay, what are we going to do next? And I, without thinking, well, previous thinking before the meeting, I had thought about it prior, but like, you know, I raised my hand and I said, I'd like to take heading out of youth soccer. And all of a sudden they're all like, okay, let's do it. And I was like, oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> Real change. Okay, what are we going to do? <laughs> what, what? So then, so, it, you know, we, we started with raising the age limit to 11 and that to me is le is a legacy is can you make change for the good and yes we brought people and that is change for the good of course more eyes more people participating in soccer loving the game sharing the game life lessons all those things amazing but if we can continue to do that while making sure that those that are participating are safer and can exercise their right to play and to be healthy for longer because the masses are the ones who are playing the game you know the elite are the very small percentage then I feel like I've added to the legacy of soccer and I that for me will be the biggest accomplishment that I could make that we made it safer so more people could play and enjoy the game for a longer time that's awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time. You are leaving and have left already. You're a living legacy. And I know that because I have not only three daughters, but soon to be a son who look up to you. And I, I encourage it. that because you're the type of person that I would love my daughters to become, uh, whatever field it's in, with your value system. So I really appreciate your time. Um, I have Brandy Chastain, gold medalist in my heart, World Cup winner, amazing person. Uh, Dave Meltzer, CEO, The Playbook.